we're in the Gospel of John chapter 15 here. Let's start with verse 9, maybe. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, this is not a sermon on joy, although it's tempting. It's noteworthy that Jesus uh, intends for his joy to remain in us. And the things that he's instructing us here have to do with that. He's, He's not given us these instructions because he wants to punish us, not because he's angry with us, He's given us these instructions because he cares that we have joy. And I don't know about you, but man, I really want joy. I, uh, I, I, I have joy. And I guard it. Hello. <laughs> uh, I guard it. I guard it because the devil would steal it. The circumstances and things that happen in life come along for the purpose of stealing it. You have to guard it. You have to guard, you have to guard the joy. Guard it. It's not just automatic. Just because you ran to the altar and prayed the prayer doesn't mean that you live your rest of your life in ignorant bliss. No, no. Hopefully you don't live your life in ignorance and and uh, uh, it's not automatic. Now he puts the love in there, he puts the joy in there, but we have to protect it. We have to guard it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> this is really a good sermon, by the way. We, although we may not get to this, we'll see. Um, let's go on. Let me finish reading this passage, and then we'll jump around a little bit. <clears throat> Verse eleven again. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. And so when um, this word here, this, the Greek word used in verse 13 for the word love is the Greek word agape. And it's different. It's a different meaning than a bunch of other uses of the word love. In the Greek language, there are a few different words that got translated into English as love. You realize that the Bible wasn't written in English. Jesus didn't speak English. Uh, he probably spoke Aramaic, because which was the common uh, language spoken at the time, although I'm sure he spoke Hebrew and stuff because he was a, Hebrew, a good Hebrew student and a, he- and a Hebrew scholar. But then uh, the Bibles that we have are mostly written in Greek because Greek was the uh, universal language, sort of sp- like, you know how English is kind of the language of business around the world today? Uh, they teach English in, in all the schools and all the other nations. They want people to know English because that's sort of the language of business. And so Greek was a good language. Um, for everybody to be able to speak. And so there's, there's three or four different words, Greek words that all get translated as love into the English. But um, they don't mean the same thing, but they all get translated love. For example, the word phileo is um, a word that kind of gets translated into brotherly love or friendship kind of love. It's not the same kind. Of, it's not romantic love. Eros, eros is... Uh, is a kind of a romantic kind of love. And, and in the English, you just read love. And so it's, we have to sometimes go back to the original language and see what, is, what was the meaning of the word in the original language to make sure that we have a good translation into the English. And so, um, and so this word agape is a different kind of word. And, and I like to use this verse to get a flavor of what the word agape really means because Jesus says the highest form of agape 
The highest expression of agape is when a man would lay down his life for a friend. When you, when you would be willing to die for your friend. When you would, when you would rush into battle for your friend. That's agape. That's the highest form. Now, every time, uh, every time you love somebody, it doesn't mean you're going to die for them. But it seems like agape always has a little bit of that sting. Always it hurts a little bit because it almost always involves sacrifice. And uh, we have a lot of different emotions. Have to be careful about emotions. Emotions are real. And uh, they're gifts, you know, gifts of God. God put emotions in us. And thank God for emotions. But you sort of have to be careful that you don't make uh, life choices based on emotions. <laughs> so, uh, when Jesus talks about this business of, of protecting the joy, let me read verse 9 again. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So he's using, in, in this passage, he keeps we keep seeing this word agape, which he's talking about sacrifice. This is a sacrificial kind of love. Uh, I have a friend. We, we have friends. We, you know, we pastored. Uh, down in in the far southern Illinois, and uh, and lived right on the Mississippi River. I could hit a golf ball from my front yard into the river if the river was up a little bit. If it was way down, and you know, Dick's seen how far I can drive a golf ball, so that tells you how close the water was. <laughs> and uh, so the organ, the lady that played the organ in the church that we pastored there in in the Grand Tower, uh, her husband was the captain of a boat that pushes barges up and down the the river, and we became good buddies. And uh, their son, Philip, went into the Marine Corps. And uh, we sort of stayed in touch with him a little bit. And and at one time, Philip was the uh, most highly decorated Marine in active duty on this side of the Mississippi because he was, he worked on helicopters, and he went out. uh, They were sending out a crew of... uh, of uh, uh, helicopters to rescue these uh, soldiers that were down, and uh, and and though, though Philip wasn't he, mean, like, he was a maintenance guy or whatever, but he knew how to fire the guns and work. And so they needed somebody. So Philip said, "I'll go," and he jumped in the helicopter, and um, and so they're trying to rescue these guys. They're trying to drag them in. Some of them are already wounded and laying on the ground and stuff. And so this this one soldier is running toward the helicopter and he falls, and Philip sees him fall. But they're sending other soldiers out to find this. No, go, you know, and and nobody can find him. But Philip says, I saw him fall. I know where he is. So Philip jumped out of the helicopter, ran, found that boy, carried him back to the helicopter, and he was awarded, I don't know what award, medals of bravery and valor and all that kind of stuff because he went out of his way to go above and beyond the call of duty and his mom his mom he said son i'm so proud of you don't you ever do that again (laughs) and uh that's the kind of that's the kind of sacrifice that we're talking about that you would lay down your life for your friend and jesus is telling us that the only way that we're going to protect This joy that we have is that we're committed to sacrificing ourselves. Doesn't that seem contrary? Doesn't that seem like you you might, in the the way the world thinks and the way the world acts, you might say, well, if you really want to have joy, then always do the things that are best for you. You know, don't... uh, You know, don't commit yourself to helping somebody who may be a drain on you, you know, because you got people in your life that are kind of want to pull you down and and drag you down. And so they'll take away your joy. Well, that's not that's not what Jesus said. 
Jesus said, if you want to keep this joy, if you want to have this joy, then you're going to have to be committed to walking in this kind of love. Walking in this kind of love. And so, we've talked about love a fair amount around here. We've talked about this kind of sacrificial love that Jesus demonstrated as he lived and died for us. And it occurred to me that we could uh, grow weary of that. And so, I wanted to talk some about the payoff. The payoff of walking in love. And the first payoff that we see right here is it protects that joy. Now, it's hard to describe that joy if you don't know what I'm talking about. It, especially if you're not a believer, uh, then it may not, you know, this may be strange. But I know that I have been through hard times and done really hard things. But underneath all the pain and anguish of it, I had this joy that was sustaining and strengthening. And you know, the Bible says the joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so I've experienced that. And uh, I grew up on a farm, and um, my daddy made me do hard things. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't appreciate it so much at the time. <laughs> Uh, could have, may have grumbled a little bit to myself when I'm out there doing hard things. I used to have to, uh, I used to have to walk the pasture with a mowing scythe to, you know, we had, we'd stretch electric fences around and uh, the weeds would grow up into the fences and short the fences out. And, you know, I would just, I would sharpen that scythe. I mean, I'd be in the men, I'd have a sharpening stone and I'd be sharp. I never got that thing so sharp that it was easy. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I didn't have the good technique, but we'd have, we'd have pastures that were, you know, 20 acres and 15 acres and 30 acres and stuff. And then send Kim out there with a mowing scythe and cut all the, cut all the weeds off from underneath the fence. And then, you know, a lot of times it's a barbed wire. So then your scythe catches on the barbed wire whenever, you know, so I've done hard things and maybe that's not hard. Maybe you don't think that's hard, but you know, whenever you're 15, 16, you think, you know, you feel bad for yourself, self-pity. Why am I out here doing this? So anyway, thank God I've done, uh, my daddy uh, taught me that I can do hard things. And Jesus taught me that if I'll do hard things and sacrifice myself, he'll give me a joy. He'll give me a joy that's sustaining, that helps me. Praise the Lord. So that's a payoff we see right there. A payoff uh, that even when you're doing hard things and making sacrificial uh, choices, that you can have a joy. Man, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. Because sometimes it really will. Some, I mean, some people have died, really literally died. And, and lots of people have made serious sacrifices. And we've talked about that a lot, you know, in so much, uh, in the world around us, uh, all you need is love, you know, if you're a Beatle fan. And um, we're talking about how wonderful love is, and they're not always talking about this kind of love that makes me sacrifice me for you because he put that love in me. So, and then, um, but I was thinking, you know, one time, I don't know, this is a long time ago. I was thinking, you know, if I were God, if I were God, I would pick the most fun thing in the universe to do, and I'd do it forever. How about that? You know, because you're God. Hello? You're God. You can do whatever you want. And so, I like doing fun things. I like riding motorcycles and, and uh, dirt bikes and uh, four-wheelers, and uh, I like driving too fast, and, and uh, there's all kind of exciting things, you know, to do, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I like doing fun stuff, and if I were God, I think I would just do, do all the f most fun things, you know, and that's all, I mean, I'd be all about that, and in the middle of thinking about that, and uh, he spoke to me, and he said, I did, I do. And I was like, yeah. And he brought to my remembrance the scripture verse that says, God is love. I 
thought, huh. He's not loved because some bully made him love. He's not loved because somebody bribed him into it. He's loved because it's the best. Let's go to, that's in 1 John. Let's go to 1 John 4, 5. No, 4. 1 John 4. Praise the Lord. Isn't he good? He's so good. In 1 John, you know, you can, you can read the whole book of 1 John about love. But here in, uh, oh, let's see where I want to start. Maybe verse 12. Okay, maybe let's go back farther than that. Let's go. Okay, 7. Bill votes 7. This is 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, there are people who are born of God that don't know him and their love instincts. You know, ah, stinks is probably too strong of a word. But they're clumsy at it and not great at it because they don't know him that well. But the better you know him, the easier it is to love, right? <clears throat> Verse 8, and he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifest toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. P propitiation really means the sacrifice that satisfies it. If you, uh... And so here, here we're seeing the sacrifice God demonstrates his love by calling our attention to the sacrifice that he made. So this goes right in line with the whole theme of that agape love is a self-sacrificing love, and it's based on my character, not yours. So like uh, I have friends like Larry, Larry Seidinger is my friend, and uh, I like Larry because of the way he is. Uh, I like Larry because how easy it is to make him laugh, and then, and, uh, and we have too much fun laughing. But if Larry was grouchy, uh, he, he might not be my friend. You know what I'm saying? I might love him as a, a, a believer. I might, I might try to witness to him, get him saved. But if he was just, just a grouchy face all the time, then I wouldn't feel the same way about him because that phileo kind of love is based on his character. Does that make sense? I like ice cream because ice cream is yummy. But you put ketchup on it, I might not like it. Does that make sense? Because it's not... But now agape love is not based on... Your character, it's based on my character. And so, uh, in Romans 5, it says that he has put his love in us. So now, agape love is a part of me. It's part of my character, even if I don't practice it. But that's maybe for another sermon. Um, verse 11, I'm in, four, I'm in uh, 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, he's talking about sacrificing his own son. Isn't that what we were just reading about? That's what we were just reading about. And so he says, if that's how God loved us, if God loved us by sacrificing his son to save us and redeem us, rescuing us, then that's how we should love one another. Now, you know, I, 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 Adam's my friend. I, I like Adam. I, I love Adam. Adam's, he, he's getting nervous now because he didn't know what Pastor Kim's going to say. But, but, you know, Adam's got tools and Adam knows how to fix things. And it would be, some people would like Adam just because he can help you with stuff. But that's not agape love. Agape love means I love Adam whenever he's in a mess, when he's in a wreck, whenever, his, whenever it's his truck in the ditch or his motorcycle on the side of the interstate, then... <laughs> Then that's, when I, then that's when I love him instead of whenever it's my motorcycle on the side of the interstate. That's another story. Maybe Adam will tell you that story someday. 
<clears throat> so if, God, if that's how God loves us, then that's how he's expecting us to love other people. <laughs> I'm not laughing at you, Bill, even though I was laughing whenever I looked at you. <clears throat> Uh, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. Uh, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. So now we're talking about the love that's perfected. So Romans 5, 5 says that, that when we receive the Holy Spirit and when you know, we're born again by the Holy Spirit, then he puts his love in us. But that love is not perfected in everybody. People, people can still be mean and cranky and selfish and stuff after they're going to heaven. Is that a funny thing? That's the funniest thing. You, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I used to say no true believer could ever say that or do that. And then, <laughs> boy, did I find out. I mean, I, I, I was always, you know, throwing rocks at people. And I'd say, no, if you're a Christian, you can't do that. If you're a Christian, you can't say that. But I found out, yeah, they can. They can still be a believer, still go into heaven. Now, that's not Christ-like for them to say that. But uh, people are broken. You need to fi have you figured that out? People are broken, and they say and do things that they're sorry for later. But um, anyway, okay. Verse 12, for no one has seen God at any time, and if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So what, what's, the, what's the indication of love that's grown and matured and perfected? Well, whenever you sacrifice yourself for someone else, then that's the demonstration that that love is in there and working the way it's supposed to be working. So, from we're talking about agape love. If I'm not sacrificing myself for my brother, then that love is sitting there just twiddling thumbs. It's not mature. It's not perfected. It's not developed. It's not working. It's dormant, unproductive, and my joy is at risk, in peril, we might say. Let's go on. <clears throat> You're not making... <laughs> Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfect. We, this is another God is love. This is, this is, another, this is another scripture uh, demonstrating that God picked the most fun thing in the universe to do, and he's doing it all the time, right? <clears throat> Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, uh, in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Uh, in the worst way, I want to go off that rabbit trail about as he is, so are we in this world. Um, because people launch on that. Oh, you know how Jesus is in heaven. That's how I am here. And they take it out of context. Yes, yeah, it's about love. It's about love. And it's true that Jesus is victorious in heaven and I'm victorious in the earth. It, that's absolutely true. Uh, it's true that Jesus is a, a conquering king, and I'm more than a conqueror because I'm in Christ. It's true that Jesus is heir, and I'm a joint heir with Jesus. But the context of this verse is that uh, the love that is with the Father in heaven is in me. That same agape love, he has put it in me. Uh, well, some, another day, maybe. Verse 18. There is... No fear in love, 
But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, that sounds like a pretty strong verse to people who are scared. (laughs) That's like a pretty strong word, uh, Pastor Kim, you know, that you're telling somebody who's just terrified and they're scared. What they really need you to do is you need to hug them. You need to go hug them and hold their hand and tell them, oh, honey, it's going to be okay. I'll... I'm here to help you. I'm here to rescue you. But what it says is, is, uh, is uh, what's the matter with your love walk? <laughs> this is pretty strong. Somebody needs this. <laughs> Surely, Lord. <laughs> uh, I've seen people deal with fear. Uh, I know that fear attacks people. And it just, doesn't it just seem kind of crazy to th- say, how is, your, how is being afraid... How is being afraid affected by your love walk? Well, this is one of those benefits to love. Whenever you're walking in love, then you're not scared about dying or losing stuff. (laughs) Which is mostly, mostly, I now, Jesus, I can't. I can't give that money to that poor man because I need that money to make my car payment. And if I, if I, if I, oh, they'll come in, the bank will come and get in my car if I give that money. I can't, I'm afraid I couldn't give that money. Well, if you love somebody with this kind of love that Jesus showed us and demonstrated us, this kind of sacrificial love, then, and he, and the Lord speaks to you and he says, yeah, give that money to that guy. Well, you know, probably the Lord will help you make your car payment. But there's a place for loving somebody so much that it wouldn't be painful to lose. Isn't that funny? In Hebrews, in Hebrews it says that Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him the joy despising despising the shame he endured the cross despising the shame because of the joy set before him though uh, when the bible uses the word despise it doesn't mean the kind of hatred that we might think to use today uh, really to despise it means to have no regard for to place no value in that it is, this is not a significant thing. I have, <laughs> I have a, I have a, uh, I have a three-quarter inch drive ratchet in my toolbox that I just despise. <laughs> it's just worthless. I'll just, it's the last, it's the last. If I, I mean, I'll use every other wrench in the toolbox before I drag that thing out because I just, I don't have any confidence in it. I don't like it. It, it, uh, you know, things could be like. I don't know, probably needs worked on or thrown away or something. You know, the only thing worse, it's worse to have a crummy tool than no tool. Because if you have no tool, you'll go buy one. But if you have a crummy one, then you won't go buy another one, but you're still stuck using that crummy tool. Anyway. So, Jesus went to the cross despising the shame, which means that the shame didn't have any power over him. Like he's perfectly humil. Do your best to humiliate me. Doesn't matter. No regard for the. I understand that the Roman uh, uh, crucifixion thing was painful. It was painful, but it was also humiliating. That was part. That was part of the punishment. They designed it that way. They wanted you to be. They wanted to, to be uh, such a deterrent. No one would ever commit a crime worthy of uh, of crucifixion. Uh, so that was uh, excruciatingly uh, painful to, to die that way and also just crazy humiliating. And Jesus despised the shame. In other words, he said the shame is really not consequential because he loved us that much. He loved us that much. He loved us that much. So if I've made this choice, that I'm happy to sacrifice. 
I'm happy to, to give and to do without following the Father, then I don't feel the pain of the loss of that the same way. And the more I live in that and walk in that, the more I notice that. Uh, I'm not perfect at it. I've been selfish. I know you probably can't believe that, but I have in my life, I have been selfish at times. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm doing better. And, uh, and this fear of torment doesn't have the power over me when I'm already said, I'm happy to just trust the Lord. I'm just going to do whatever he says to do. And if he says, uh, get down in the mud with this guy, and then I'll just gonna, I'll get down in the mud with him. Or if he says, give this, I'm just going to give that. In fact, you know what? In fact, in what Peter's, in First Peter, it says, if you've suffered, you know, First you know, Peter's, you love First Peter, right? It's all about suffering. <clears throat> well, not all, but it's like 90% about suffering. And First Peter's says, if you've made your choice, if you've suffered, it says you've ceased. Well, let's just look there. Hold your finger there. <laughs> this is a happy sermon. This is like a perfect Christmas sermon, don't you think? This is like, man, how about this? Pain and suffering and sacrifice. I'm really trying to get, a, get, get past this step, but <clears throat> this is, uh, I'm in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind. A, a little bit later here, we may, we may look at Philippians chapter 2, talking about the Christ suffering in the flesh. But if, if you've already made the choice that you're happy to suffer, no, I'm happy to suffer. I'm happy to do without. I was, but pastor, uh, but, but, but Jesus, I, I was saving this money for a cruise. You know, we wanted to go on a cruise. I was saving this money for a cruise, and, and God said, no, send it to that missionary. I'm like, oh, there goes my cruise. Well, if you've already made the choice that you're happy to follow Jesus, and just go over, he says, go, and do whatever he says, do, then there's not so much pain in that uh, sense of loss that... Uh, <laughs> Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. <laughs> ceased from sin. If you've made that consecration that you're going to follow God and you're going to live for God and you're going to serve God and you're going to do whatever he wants, then you're not, you're not scared about losing. Uh, there's no terror. Uh, I'm afraid, what, am I, what is this going to cost me? What bad things are going to, you know, what if it cost me my life? You know, I'm looking forward to heaven. It'd be okay. It'd be okay with me if, if, uh, if you know, we heard a trumpet and pew, we're out of here uh, this morning. But, uh, you know, even if I'm a martyr, uh, now, I don't want to go home before my assignment's finished. I want, to, I, want to go, I want to go home and I want to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear him say, what are you doing here? You're not, you're not done. Chicken? <laughs> no, he probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. So, well, let's, let's go to Philippians chapter 2. Because I want to say there's an upside to this sacrificial love game. Game is probably not the right word to use. But there's things about it that resembles a game because there's rules involved in the way that you do it and go about things and, and stuff. But here in Philippians chapter 2, uh, you know, we're instructed about this. <clears throat> I'll read this a little bit faster. Uh, I'm, at, I'm at verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2. Therefore... If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any of, uh, affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done 
through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You know, I used to always read that verse, and I used to always puzzle over better at what? Because, you know, like when it comes to golf, you know, I'm better than Dick. (laughs) But something else, he may be better than me, you know comes to shooting, you know, probably Adam is better than me. So what are we talking about? Better at what? Better at what? And, uh, you know, my wife and I, we watch British TV a fair amount. And, and we've read books written by British authors and, and things. And uh, I was watching, I was watching a, a, some British TV show. And uh, this person that was of nobility was speaking to this common person. And they said, you need to learn how to conduct yourself in the presence of your betters. And I thought, oh, that's what that means. That a person, a person of low status has to behave in a certain way with regard to people who are of a higher status, who are their betters. So, if I'm being told here that in lowliness of mind, I should look at everybody as my better. So, let's just say, let's just say, uh, here I, I'm in this room full of y'all, y'all are here then I look at myself like I'm the butler at your house. I'm the kid, I'm the stable boy. And any, whatever, anything that you need, anything that, you know, I'm, I look at all of you as there's no depth to which I wouldn't stoop to serve you, to bless you, A person who esteems others as they're better than they are accommodating and servile. Boy, wouldn't churches be different? Wouldn't churches be different if everybody in the room thought everybody else was high, high bred and noble? And I'm just, you know, thank God they let me in, you know. Just thank God they let me in. And there's no, nobody in this room that I wouldn't lick their boots. In the, this is, almost makes it more uh, powerful that Jesus stripped himself and washed the feet of his disciples and said, you know what you've seen me do? You do. Anybody who can say, ouch? I think we all should be convicted. Come on. Way too much selfishness in the body of Christ. Come on. Selfish preachers and selfish deacons and selfish worship leaders and selfish. Come on. Way too much. Way too much. And subsequently, too much pain, too much, uh, too much suffering, uh, too much angst, because you're not going to protect the joy by not walking in love. So you're sitting there miserable, miserable and griping about everybody else in the room. Hello? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Probably nobody here has ever been that way. Griping, griping about everybody in the room because you're miserable. And it's not their fault. So even though on the front side, on the front side, it looks like, you know, man, that is just a hard thing. How could Jesus ask us to sacrifice ourselves? I mean, that's just painful. I mean, that just stinks. And the truth is, on the back side of that, 
It is a joy that nobody can steal. Not the devil himself can't steal your joy if you've made that commitment to walk in love. Praise the Lord. Let's go on. Let's go on here in Philippians. Verse 4, this is Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you look not out on for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I mean, I'm happy for your roof to not leak. You know, the Bible, in Galatians, it says, you know, some chores, some people need help with their chores, and some people just need to do their own chores. I mean, that's Pastor Kim's paraphrase. You know, there are some chores you need to do yourself, but then there are some chores that nobody could do you, without help. Is it? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Verse 5, now, let this mind be in you. One of my translations on my computer says, uh, uh, think this within you. This is how you're supposed to be thinking. Let this mind, this is the way you look at things. This is your perspective. You know, he's telling you. Well, I don't, you know, that's not how I feel. Change how you feel. I don't, that's not how I feel. I don't feel like that. Well, I'm telling you how to feel. I'm telling you how to think because how you think affects how you feel. How you talk affects how you feel. All right. Uh, Verse five. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. Now, now, so here's what's going on here. Now, We're beginning to talk about the sacrifice that he made. Okay. Uh, His willingness to suffer and and the extent of it. And so, verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, that's a really a hard, in in the first place, that's a fairly complicated thought to have. And it's hard to translate into English well. And so I'm going to tell you what it means to me. And I don't think I'm stupid. I've I've studied it some. But, you know, if you don't think it means this, then (laughs) I'm not mad at you. I wouldn't get in a fist fight over this. But, you know, Jesus is God. You know, he's the Christ. Has always been God. Okay, I'm going to pause this just for a second. So there's a new movie out that I haven't seen. You know, Jesus has always been. Jesus has always been. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He's the third person of the triune God. He has always been. He will always be. Now, we didn't always call him Jesus. He was the son. He was, in some places, he's the angel of the Lord. He's the son of man. But it wasn't until he was born in Bethlehem that we started calling him Jesus or Yeshua or however you want to say his name. And... uh, And so this idea that he lived in the realm of the spirit and then uh, came, accepted a body and took on human form in in which we will call the incarnation. Uh, Now he'll have a physical body like all of us will have forever, as far as I can tell. So this is talking about that even the incarnation is a sacrifice. But so there's this movie. I've just seen the commercials for it. And this movie has the idea. It's called Souls. It's like a Disney thing. And it's the idea of all these little spirits running around in heaven who God takes these little spirits and puts them in the bodies. That's heresy. That's heresy. There are, other, there are other false religions who believe that. And they go from there into the idea that we're all divine, that we're all divinity. So if I were you, I'm not sure I'd let my grandkids watch this movie. It's cute. I mean, it could be hilarious, you know. It could be hilarious. But the idea that we, because we are not all divine, we are not all eternal beings. We have not always been you know, God made Adam, and there's Adam, and then he breathed into Adam, and Adam became a living soul. And uh, heaven is not full of souls just up there waiting to be shoved into bodies down, because there's, I mean, there's a fair, fair amount of false doctrine and error and heresy all wound up in that concept. And so that's, 
you know, I'd be very careful about, I may watch it just to see what it's, you know, what it does say, but I would certainly be careful about putting those thoughts and that method, line of thinking into the little kids whom that movie is clearly aimed at. All right, so here we, so the incarnation is the beginning of his suffering. Okay, uh, so verse six, who did not, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. So, okay, this word, this word that's translated robbery in my new King James, the word really means to grab or clasp or snatch. So if you, if you think of snatching something, then robbery is not a terrible translation of that word. And so I'm really not throwing rocks at the translators. But what I see happening here in this verse is that even though Jesus is God, He's, he is a member of the Trinity. He's divine. He is almighty. He is the Christ. That he didn't cling to that. He released. He still got. He released so that he could come in the earth and be incarnated and be a man, which is what we all just had celebrated at Christmas. So that's a sacrifice just to take on human form. And then, of course, the things that he did while he was here, he did them as a man, which, you know, I'm sorry to say a bunch of Christendom has it wrong. They think they think that Jesus uh, did miracles because he was God. But Jesus did miracles the same way Elijah did miracles. The same way that Moses did miracles, uh, the same way that miracles happened through all the prophets up until his day, he did them by faith. He, he heard the voice of the Lord. And what did Jesus say? He said, the things that you hear me say are things the Father told me to say, things that you see me do, things the Father told me to do. Um, and so um, Jesus, it was a sacrifice. I, and I'm, I'm careful to say he was always God. He never ceased to be God. He was always God. But when he walked here, he didn't walk as God. So when Jesus raised the dead, he did it just like you or I would. Now, his faith was really great. And he didn't have the ugly, sinful past that sometimes hangs us up. But uh, it was the beginning of his sacrifice that he accepted uh, this assignment to come to the earth and take on human form. And so hope you can hear that whenever we read this verse, um, verse six, again, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, or he didn't have to hang on. He didn't have to scratch and claw to hang on to that power and authority. I kind of use it as an example of like, sometimes I say like, you know, a cop takes off his badge. You know, it's like, you've seen it in the movies before. Like, you know, the, the cop is arguing with, is it, is it like pejorative to say cop, a police officer, a police officer is in a fight with some dude. And so this dude says, I can't hit you. You got a badge on. And so the cop takes his badge off and then they start going at it kind of thing. So that, like Jesus took his badge off. He didn't cease to be God, but he didn't come here and operate as God. Verse uh, seven, but made himself of no reputation. I think that's what that's talking about. Taken the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So it's a staggering concept to even think about how he would humble himself to take on a human body. I mean, if he was a king in a human body, it'd still be a sacrifice, but he wasn't a king. He was a servant and he agreed to die. What did he say? He said, no man takes my life, but I lay it down. And to die the most horrible, awful, painful, humiliating death that the Romans could think of. That's the sacrifice he made. Now look at verse 9. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him 
and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what I'm gonna what I want to draw your attention to is verse 9, therefore. Uh, the, the, in my uh, in the old, in the King James it says wherefore, in the from the uh, Strong's dictionary it says through which thing that is consequently, for which cause. In other words, the path that Jesus, the path that leads to highly exaltation, a name above every name. The path that leads to every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. That path is the path of suffering. And so what I want to say, if I humble myself to serve my brother, it may sting. If I humble myself to say, oh yeah, here's my cruise money. Sending my cruise money to the missionary. There's a glory on the other side that is a surpassing glory. So be brave, my children. (laughs) Be brave to obey the Lord and follow his direction because there's no sacrifice that he's going to ask you to make that he doesn't have a reward for down the line that is far surpassing. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to give you a name above every name. I'm not saying every knee is going to bow and confess that you're Lord to the glory of God the Father because he's never going to ask you to die for the sins of the whole world. You know, only Jesus can make that sacrifice. So he's not going to ask you to make that sacrifice. But I'm here to tell you that there's a reason to hang on. There's a reason to humble yourself because your flesh won't want to. You're going to have to fight the flesh. The flesh will say, I'm too tired. I'm too busy. Uh, I can't do that. That, that hurts. Uh, whatever. The, the flesh will say, no, I don't want to do that. And I'm here to tell you, hang in there. So hallelujah. The first thing I want to say is that there's a weight of glory on the backside of that that is a surpassing glory. And the second thing <clears throat> I want to say is this love is what makes your faith work. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Because we're all about faith, huh? This is faith fellowship. This is not fear fellowship. It's not friend fellowship. It's not falcons fellowship. Shut up, Kim. All right, all right. (laughs) It's not fastball fellowship. So in Galatians chapter 5, oh, I just want to read this whole thing. Let's start with verse 4. Uh, okay, verse 1. This is, this is Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So what he's talking about is uh, the temptation that people are being uh, to go back to Judaism after they've been uh, set free from Judaism uh, to go to re- to start be Jews uh, new or go back, and uh, <laughs> he says that's entangled again with a yoke of bondage. This is verse two. Indeed, I Paul say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. That's a strong. Hello, does anybody get that? That's a strong. That's a strong. That's a, <laughs> That's a strong thing to say. What on earth, what on earth could you do so devastating to your own soul that would cause Christ to profit you nothing? Well, it turns out what you could do is try to prove to God how holy you are by your good works and obedience to some religion's rules and regulations. That deserves more time, doesn't it?
Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. And you've become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by a law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. This doesn't mean, this does not mean that we're waiting for the day that we'll be righteous. No, no, I've been made righteous. But righteousness comes with a hope. Righteousness comes with an expectation that we wait for by faith. But faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They're on the way. They're coming. So I'm righteous now because blood, the blood of Jesus was shed for me. I'm already righteous. I'm not going to be, truthfully, I'm not going to be any more righteous the day I stand before the throne than I am right now because it's the same blood that cleansed me and I'm cleansed by the blood. But I'll look better then. <laughs> I'll have a few less spots and wrinkles because, you know, he's coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. So uh, in the flesh, I'll, I'll be better looking. <laughs> Verse 5 again. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, which is by faith. So we're going we're gonna to receive that hope by faith. It's not the righteousness that we're, that we're uh, receiving by faith. It, it, never mind. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Huh? So as it turns out, if you keep those rules, it doesn't really accomplish anything. And if you say, I'm not keeping, I'm eating fried chicken, and I'm eating shrimp, and, and I'm eating catfish, I'm not, I'm not taking a bath, I'm not, you know, he's not impressed by that either. God, God is not any more impressed by your refusing to keep the law than he is by people who keep the law. So where I'm at with it is, look, if you want to eat catfish, fine. If you don't want to eat catfish, good, that's good on you. It's up to you. I don't care. One more catfish for me. <laughs> for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith. Working through love. King James says, faith worketh by love. And so it's love that makes your faith work. Faith doesn't work by greed. Faith doesn't work by desperation. Faith, uh, uh, faith works by love. And I've known, I've known of folks who can't figure out why they can't. <laughs> I, I know a person. I heard him say it out of their own mouth. This, this person was hearing testimonies of the blessings people were receiving. Just really wonderful, nice, nice blessings. And, uh, and this person said, when is it going to be my turn? <laughs> When is it going to be my turn? Well, I think there's something about faith works by love. If you can't celebrate somebody else's blessings, if somebody, come on, if you see, if you see me roll into the parking lot with the new uh, Cadillac and Escalade, uh, you should be happy for me. Hello? Not that I would probably get one. I'd probably get a navigator. I, I, I don't really know. I mean, who knows? It could be a Corvette or. Can you be happy for me to be blessed? When I was, when I was at a student at Rama, this is, you know, just a couple days ago. <laughs> when I was a student at Rama, they came out with a new uh, Ford. I was at the Ford dealer and they had these new Mustangs. And uh, I just went to look at it. And I said, Lord, one day I, I won't, I'll have one of these. One day I receive it by faith. And I don't really care if it's brand new or if it's used. Or, I mean, I don't really care. I just want one of these. And, uh, and that was it. I just said that. And I didn't really think about it a lot. I didn't worry about it. I didn't lay up nights dreaming about it. But I got out of Rama and somebody said, somebody came up to me and said, I have some uh, money that I need to give to the Lord. It's set apart for that purpose. And the Lord told me to buy you a car. Pick one out. 
So what did I pick out? I picked out a Mustang, Rhonda. I picked out a Mustang, 302, 302 V8, four-speed overdrive, manual transmission, and uh, ordered, it for, ordered it brand new from the factory. And uh, one of my friends was angry and jealous about that. Well, he was good about not telling me till later. <laughs> if you, I mean, I didn't manipulate anybody. I didn't go around sending out pledge cards. <laughs> and I, I'm not against pledge cards or anything, you know what I'm saying? I didn't do anything, I didn't do anything to make it happen. Uh, I was like, wow. And uh, my... My point is not about new cars. My point is, if you have, a, if pe- if your friends and family are being blessed by the Lord, and you got a problem with that, you're jealous about that. I'd say, you know, check up on yourself. Love is what makes our faith work. Love is what, and if I, if I love my brother, and the Lord blesses him. How happy am I? I'm like, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, way to go. Love is what makes your faith work. Come on, faith worketh by love. There's a blessings, there's blessings on the other side of the sacrifice that are so worth it. I, I don't want you to miss, you know, I don't want to spend so much time talking about the sacrifice that we miss the blessing on the backside of that. Okay, one more passage and then we'll quit. We'll get the worship team back up here in just a minute. And we'll... So in, the, in Philippians, scooting over a couple chapters here in uh, chapter four. I'll start with verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4. This is Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. If he says it twice in the same verse, he thinks he may may mean something by that. You think think he's serious about that? Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. So that's anxiety is a common, uh, people take anti-anxiety drugs. Uh, it's a problem in our society. It has been for a long time. It's not a new thing. People are worried and, and scared about stuff. Um, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Now, I want to say that thanksgiving means that you kind of believe that he's already answered your prayer. So I want to say thanksgiving is an expression of your faith, because I want to get faith mixed into this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Come on, you know somebody, and maybe it's not you, but you know somebody who needs their heart and mind guarded. Because they're a wreck. Hello. I mean, it spills out on everything. They're a wreck. They're a wreck. Because their hearts and, and, and minds are unguarded. Verse 7 again. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I want to say, it's when, you, when people look at you and say, how are you not sick with worry? <laughs> How are you, how, how come you're not in the bathroom vomiting? You're so upset and, and a mess. Well, because I have a peace. I have a peace that passes understanding. You can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. I can't tell you why. All I can tell you is the Holy Spirit's all over me. And I got a joy that's way deep down inside. And I know that he's with me. And I know he works all things together for my good. I'm not going to worry about it. I've already prayed. 
I've already cast all my care over on him. Hallelujah. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. You know, the devil doesn't get you with good reports. He always throws bad reports on you. Bad reports. No, 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 no. no. Don't think, don't meditate on that. I, t- I shared the testimony about how uh, during the te- our revival meetings with the Harbisons, how uh, for months the devil was telling me your arthritis, you're going to have arthritis in your hand, and my hand would hurt. And uh, there are times whenever I would, you know, I would change the way I played a guitar chord because my hand would hurt uh, when I played it a certain way, and uh, stuff. And the devil would, the devil, the, the, he didn't give me any good reports. He always said, oh, your uncle has, ar- your uncle has a rheumatoid arthritis, and that's what you're getting. You're getting that arthritis, and the day's going to come when you won't even be able to play guitar anymore. How are you going to have church if you can't play guitar? Huh? How are you going to worship the Lord? How are you going to serve God? You're not, you better get a plan going. You better figure out something. Maybe you go to the doctor, and he'll start you on some kind of medicine. And I said, I don't have arthritis, and I won't have arthritis in Jesus' name. And honestly, I couldn't tell you when it left. But I'm just playing guitar one day, and I'm playing chords, and I'm like, Hey, that doesn't hurt a bit. That doesn't hurt a lick. And, and honestly, I don't know if, I just know that I just wouldn't receive that report. I wouldn't let myself think about it. Because, you know, you might. You might say, well, what could I do? I could learn to play piano. <laughs> I can switch the bass. Uh, you know, uh, and just meditate and open the door of your mind for that to take root in your life. But I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. It's, if it's not a good report, I'm not focusing on it. Hello? Come on, this is for somebody. If it's not a good report, I'm not focusing on it. Hello? I'm not mad at the doctor because he gave me a bad report. I'm not mad at my financial planner because he said, you don't have enough money to retire yet or whatever. Huh? I'm not mad at the people who gave me the bad report. I just don't, I don't meditate on that. What do I meditate on? Then? Well, I meditate on how good God is. <laughs> what all these things here, whatever things are true and uh, whatever things are noble, there's an honor about that. Hmm? A, 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 in noble thoughts how you can help people, how you can be a blessing to people. Whatever things are just means fair. Whatever things are pure, not selfish, you know, pure hearted. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. (laughs) I used to kind of have the idea that it was okay just to let any thoughts run around your brain. Just whatever popped in there, just let it run around. And uh, I came to the realization, uh uh-uh. Yeah, some, some thoughts you have to just reject them and refuse to think about. Sometimes, sometimes I go, go to the television, turn the television on, so I'll think about that instead of all the stuff the devil is like, you know, I mean, I'm not preaching TV. TV is really good for you. <laughs> I'm not preaching TV, but I'm just telling you, that sometimes you can just do whatever it takes to get those thoughts out of your head. I mean, just make yourself not think. I was talking, Jennifer and I were talking about that. She's done really great on her diet. And, you know, all the way through all the Christmas holidays when everybody just did their best to make the most yummy desserts to tempt her. I mean, she was perfect. I mean, I didn't see her stick a coconut crumb in her mouth. Uh, and so what she said was, she said, I just had to not think about it. Uh, and I'm, we, we talked about that, and I said, you know, that's a lesson for all of us. That's a, really a lesson about I can control what I think about. I can control what I think about. And so if I'm all about the love of Jesus and the sacrifice that he's made for me and the love that he's put in my heart, and I have this compassion 
for my brother that I would sacrifice my agenda and my stuff to be a blessing, to be help, to be helpful to him, which is what goes on to talk about in, in 1 John chapter 4, which we didn't read all those verses. Then if, I'm, if, I, if that's my focus and that's my heart and, and I obey the Lord in faith, then on the other side of that journey, on the other side of that sacrifice is a far better way of glory 